What if how you end is just as important as how you begin? I'd like to welcome Scott Ritzheimer to the Design Your Legacy podcast this lovely Friday morning. Welcome, Scott. Angelina, thanks for having me. I'm very excited about this conversation. It is my pleasure. So I had an opportunity to read your book, which is complimentary to any of the listeners out there if they go to your website, and I believe you'll provide a link at the end of our, our episode today. And you start out with this metaphor, and I'm not necessarily a sports person, but I think that the story you share is where the coach runs out to the middle of the field to make the star play because he or she these days isn't allowing their players to do it. Would you like to start here? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's funny, like, as and, and that's about all you need to know about sports. There's a lot of other details, but those are irrelevant. The thing that I want to just pause on is how crazy that would be. So let's take it even out of the professional sports world and just put it into, like, you know, your your girls' volleyball team, right? Middle school girls' volleyball. And, and let's say, you know, coach is there, they love their team, and they want more than anything for those girls to win, right? And they want it so much that... Every time things start to get a little rough, they get a little behind on the score, the coach runs on and starts taking the next serve, right? That would be crazy. I mean, like they would get booed off of the court. Like that that wouldn't happen. And if it did, everyone, including the coach, would know that it was wrong. But as crazy as that is in the world of sports, I see it happen every single day in the world of business. We want even leaders who want their teams to succeed, they want it so badly or or they 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 try to help them succeed in the wrong way. And what happens is we cross over that uh, that sideline. Right. Which which for business owners, for CEOs, for founders, that sideline is invisible and, right. and we cross over it and and we jump in and we save the day. And we expect our team to celebrate. And in fact, what happens, especially if you do it a lot, is your very best people won't celebrate it. They'll be frustrated by it. Uh, your, your highest potential leaders won't accelerate because of it. You will stunt their growth in doing that. And so the reason why I wrote the book, one of the many reasons is that for founders, there is a distinct journey that they follow that, that, that drives success in that. Uh, and we walk through the seven stages in the book, but it's invisible. There's nobody to tell you that the stage has changed. So if you're still trying to be the star player on the field, when what your team really needs from you as a coach on the sideline, you're going to undermine your own success. Yeah, absolutely. So I work in the capacity of an advisor slash coach. And so I would like to bring up the metaphor of Tony Robbins, because I thought about the metaphor of he is an amazing coach. If you'd like to hire him, he's probably in the millions of dollars. And yet having said that, he also had to start Robbins Research and the Tony Robbins Foundation and delegate. So I know that you, and we chatted about this briefly in our preamble, you had brought up this metaphor growing up. You were in a mall, a shopping mall, and you needed a map to go from finding your mother in JC Penney because you wanted to go to Foot Locker and you went to the map in the mall that said you are here and when i think about founders and entrepreneurs that have this amazing idea especially today in the gig economy where more and more young people want to step into this world of becoming an entrepreneur but they're missing that roadmap so would you walk us through those seven stages as briefly as possible and then i want to break down towards the the second half of our conversation some of the challenges that are very real world. So we've got about two hours for this episode, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, so just very, very quickly, I'm going to walk through all seven stages. And one of the things that I do, even if you're not a big sports person, which uh, ironically, I'm not a big sports person. It's just, it just helped solve the invisibility of, of this pattern. So what I do, and, and if you don't know sports, it's okay. You don't need to know sports. But what I do to help make this more visible, to give us something as founders to grab onto for each of the stages, I compare it to a, a position in a sports hierarchy. I'll explain what that means. So at the very beginning, the, the founder's journey actually starts before they launch, right? The stage one of the journey is what I call the dissatisfied employee. 
you look at any Genesis story from a founder and, and you'll find this time that they were, they may not have been an employee, but there's this period of dissatisfaction where they, they realize there could, there must be a better way. Uh, th there's a, a better way to do roofing. There's a better way to treat employees. There's a better way to treat clients or customers, whatever it may be. Uh, and, and that stage I equate to being a trainee on the sideline. You actually don't know how the game is played, but but from the sideline, you're starting to see that there's a better way. And and so that's stage one. It's actually pre-launch. What do we do pre-launch to succeed? Uh, and in the book, we give some strategies on how to do that. For the sake of time, let's look at what happens when you launch, right? So the, the turning point, the transition point from stage one, trainee on the sideline, dissatisfied employee, to stage two, startup entrepreneur, is uh is when you go full time right so this is day 1 you know of the of the game you're getting in and and the goal at this stage is to be the best star player that you can be so there's a time in the entrepreneurial journey when you do make the diving catch when you do go above and beyond when when you do jump in and save the day and and that's highly appropriate early on if you don't do it who's going to right because it's it's you uh, Right. And I think that that initial stage one is uh, of that dissatisfied employee is that they see that void. That's exactly right. They, yeah, they do. They, 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 the, the def yeah. The defining question is, isn't there a better way, right? Isn't there a better way? And, and that, that dissatisfaction builds up to a point that they have to do something about it. And that's when they jump in and start their company. And so they're in this search of a better way. They're, they're, uh, they're out there doing it. They're testing whether they've got what it takes. Uh, and that's what stage one's all about. And it's really hard, right? Stage one, going out, starting a business, uh, depending on who you ask, six out of 10 to eight out of 10 to nine out of 10 of them fail. And so what happens in the mind of, of a founder is that we learn the 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 necessary business survival skills right of going in and getting it done no matter what and what happens we we start to get success we start to bring in more clients go ahead well i was just going to say that it, one of the distinctions that your book makes is that if somebody can learn on someone else's dime compared to their own penny this yes. is the moment and and i also wanted to bring up uh that you wrote in uh, on page 12 of your book comfortable people don't become founders comfortable people don't yes. launch businesses plant new churches or start new nonprofits. But it's not necessarily, uh, that's where in terms of the transformation, you, you brought up the next point of eight out of 10 new founders fail. So it's also a conversation today regarding the transformation around identity and behavior. Please continue. Yes. Yeah. And it's so true. I think a significant reason for why so many of those fail is that we don't embrace stage one. We don't stay in that dissatisfaction and develop the skill sets that we need to succeed. We are so prone as a culture to try to avoid pain that we actually create more pain in stage two by jumping in prematurely. Uh, so uh, Let's say we, we get beyond that, we get into this stage two, uh, and, and what you find in stage two is that it's, it, it's about three times harder, three times more expensive, and three times longer to get anything done. So uh, the, the big question we find ourselves asking in this stage two is, what was I thinking? You're like, what in the world was I thinking jumping into this stage? Because it's, it's a challenge. But it's it's a very exciting challenge, and, and many founders actually feel alive, even though it's really difficult, even though there's a high chance that this thing's not going to work. There's something invigorating about that second stage. Yeah, you said it's being in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and and the ability you you take most founders, successful founders, uh, and the ability to just say to show I've got what it takes, right? Uh, the the ability to go out and create something from nothing. The word entrepreneur is actually rooted uh, in in the phrase the, to go between, right? And so you see these founders jumping into the game to prove whether or not they have what it takes. Uh, and and it's actually doing that that creates the success that necessarily thrusts you into the third stage. Yeah. So I want to make a point about uh, the stage two, the startup entrepreneur. They do what they do better than anyone else. They are the best of the best, and the game heavily rewards the best. And yet, a part of this growth process is the the, the point of what I might call self-development, uh, personal development, or you say develop you. 
And I think that's what really this comes back to is somebody being able to go into their mindset and say, okay, well, these are the skill sets to stage one, the dissatisfied employee. Here are the skill sets for stage two, the startup entrepreneur. And every time somebody is willing to grow, they have to let go of one set of skills and be open to absorbing a new set of skills. That's absolutely right. And never, uh, I'll say seldom is this more true than the shift from that startup entrepreneur stage to stage three. There's something that I call the star player paradox. And that is that the, the, the higher caliber a player you are, the harder the transition is into the next stage, which I call the captain on the field. Or in the business world, I call it the reluctant manager. Which is it's not three. a fun thing. So so folks are always saying, hey, I want to get to the next level. I want to get to the next level. And then they realize the next level is reluctant managers. So hold on a second. This isn't what I signed up for. And, and the defining question here is what's wrong with these people? Because most founders at this stage recognize they have to have help. They've got to get people coming in and helping them out. They bring in a few employees and, and those employees don't think like we do. Right? They don't act like we do. They don't take ownership like we do. And it leaves us frustrated and reluctant as managers. Yes. I think one of the points that you brought up is in stage two, the individual, the founder, has that smile on their face, no matter how many times they've been knocked out in the, in the concrete jungle, in the boxing ring, et cetera. And then stage three is you bring up the very poignant question, which is great, of would you work for yourself? Because even if yeah. you think about somebody like Steve Jobs, he was a founder and I've I've coached people uh, that have worked with him and for him. He was a tough character. He was not easy to work with, but he was a visionary founder. So you bring up this question of would you work for yourself? And I think that's a, a humbling question. Yes. And the answer is almost unequivocally no, right? If you, if, because as a founder, if you could be satisfied working for you, you would have a job somewhere else. It's way easier to succeed in a job than it is to create a business from nothing. And so we have to recognize that, no, we wouldn't work for us, right? People who are wired like us go and do what we're doing. They create their own thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, I, I think you're a millennial. You're somewhere, I, I think, between 36 and 43, somewhere within that ballpark. But in your life's journey, you've had an opportunity to work with, I think you said about 20,000 businesses to see the yeah. patterns, the distinctions of what makes a founder win, what makes their organization become great. And I think we're going to close out today's conversation with, with your sharing your legacy of what you would like, but also realizing how a founder takes their business to that of a dynamic organization where they pass that baton to another yeah. visionary. But what else would you like to say about stage three? So stage three, here's, here's the thing. We, we as founders don't find stage three to be our natural stomping ground. It is, it's hard for most founders, just from a wiring perspective, because there's not a person out there who started their business to become a manager, right? It, it, that, that nobody has done that. And so when they find themselves a manager, they're like, why did I do this? Uh, and, and, and a lot of times what we'll try and do is just hire somebody else to manage everyone for us. And that's actually the right strategy. But if you don't learn the necessary management skills yourself first, that that strategy of hiring else someone to do it is dead on arrival. You won't know how to manage them well. You won't know how to hold them accountable. And ultimately, it's going to stunt your growth. So you've got to learn just the rudimentary management skills. And when you do, it, it opens the door to successfully uh, uh, interview, select, hire, train, and hold accountable a high-quality manager who can act as your number two, your second in command. And that combination, that number one, number two combination is what creates an enormous amount of growth for organizations. But it starts this, this progression uh, into stage four. And, and most folks are thinking if stage three is reluctant manager, stage four must be a lot better, right? So that would be a great time to move on. I've got bad news for you. Stage four is called the disillusioned leader. Now, it doesn't mean that it's all bad. But what's happening in stage four is we start to realize that businesses get bigger. They don't inherently get better. What happens in stage four is we start reaching these milestones that we've set for our organization, a million, five million, 
10 million, a million dollars in profit, a hundred million dollars. Doesn't really matter what the number is. We all have this kind of arbitrary line that we think once we get across that line, we will be successful. Once we get across that line, business will be easier. And we find out that's not really how it is, that we stop having some of the problems that we had earlier on, but they are replaced by bigger, hairier, and more challenging problems. And we're left with this question, is this it? Like, is this really as good as it gets? Like, is this really what being a founder is all about? And and we find ourselves in this disillusioned and sometimes down a disheartening stage. Yeah, I think what was interesting about stage four, the overwhelmed leader, is you brought up that the first is time telling. So if the, I think it, I think you also brought up a metaphor about a pilot. There's one thing to fly by day, then there's one thing to fly by night. And if they're yes. flying by their senses in the daytime, at night they have to fly by their instruments. It's completely different. Yeah. So in stage four, the overwhelmed leader, you brought up about how enduring organizations are built. And although you don't have to sprint at all anymore, clock building is very hard work. So again, they have to shift from one skill set of being the star leader to then being that startup uh, or being the dissatisfied employee, to being the startup entrepreneur, to being that reluctant manager where, you know, they have to have really great communication skills. And now the overwhelmed leader, they have to figure out how do they systemize what they have been able to do unconsciously and they're just great at it. Yeah. And it's that's a hard thing to do. The more intuitive something is, the harder it is to actually understand how to teach it to somebody else. And what happens for this stage, the personal side of this disillusionment is that you actually don't quite know how it works, right? And, and the proof of that is that you fail to reproduce it in others. That's what makes us want to jump back onto the field because our folks aren't leading at the level that we would. They're not succeeding at the level we would. And, and we get frustrated by our inability to level them up and we jump in and try and save the day and it undermines everything we've worked for. Well, it's interesting because I think sometimes when founders are very good at what they do, they forget what it is to start again and have that capacity for patience when yes. somebody is trying because they're, it, it comes easy to them at that point. I just want to reiterate uh, something about this stage before you go on to stage five. You wrote, you were a great time teller. Well done. And by being a great time teller, you created the opportunity to become a clock builder. So again, yes. it's, your book touches upon the skills that are essential, that are mandatory, and also being able to let go of what worked yesterday just when you got into your comfort zone. Yes. Yeah, Jim Collins is the one who has the time telling. And, and if you want more information on that, he, it's part of, uh, he's got a whole chapter on it. And I believe it's built to last about level five leaders. Phenomenal, phenomenal concept. And the idea is you can be really, really good at whatever it is that you do, or you can be really, really good at building an organization that is good at whatever you do. It's a different skill set. And to step up into stage five, that's exactly what you need to learn to do. And in the same token that we can lose patience with our people, we can lose patience with our own process because stepping into that, just because you're a great time teller doesn't mean you're a great clock builder. It's a new skill set. And we have to have the patience with our own learning process to learn that new set of skills to take our organization and our founder's journey to the next level. Yes. So stage five, and I know we, we've got a window of time right now, is the chief executive officer. And I thought it's interesting. You brought up a point that a lot of times founders on their business card will say founder and CEO, but they don't really get to be CEO until stage five. And one of the things you said is stepping into the CEO role is like stepping into the bridge of an aircraft carrier. Sure, the waves are there, but you hardly even notice them. You just see the horizon. You feel the weight, momentum, and power of your ship. And again, your words carry weight and go far beyond what you could do or accomplish independently. What else would you like to, to share about stage five? Uh, the thing that I want folks to catch about stage five, especially if you find yourself in stage four or one of the earlier stages, uh, is that stage five is what makes it all worth it up to this point, right? If there was no stage five, you would never want to get to stage four. When folks are in stage four, that, that disillusioned leader, that, that coach on the sideline struggling to figure out the next step, uh, 
what makes that skill set worth it as hard as it is is the ability to step into that like you mentioned the captain on the bridge right where there is this there's this feeling of poise and control and vision and freedom that comes in stage five that genuinely makes it all worth it i get this wonderful opportunity to teach this to founders and ceos all across the country and, and when I get to this stage, you can see those that have been there or are there, right? The room separates almost instantly between those who've actually tasted stage five and those who are still working their way toward it. And the folks that are in stage five, it, it just, they light up again and they're like, they're, you're right, it is so wonderful. We can only survive usually a couple of years in stage four, like when we're really in it, you, you've got to find a way either up or down some way to get out. You can survive stage five for decades, right? When you look at how most founders are wired, if they do the hard work of getting to stage five, of moving from time telling to clock building, they, they, what happens is they create a role for themselves, this CEO, this chief executive role that is actually highly aligned with who they are and what they are naturally skilled at. And it, it's a beautiful thing. So I always like to pause here and say, if you're in an earlier stage, it's going to be worth it. Just stay the course. Yes. And I just want to uh, reiterate that I think this conversation is so important because 80% of my listeners are male. So I think a lot of times young men think about providing and protecting and hunting the deer, and yet they don't have that roadmap. I want to make one other point about stage five before we go to stage six. You said here, you asked the question, what is it that only you can do? Because leading away from the field is a strange thing to do. And it can often leave you feeling out, put out to pasture. So again, I think that people have like this great vision. They're going to come up with this product or service or this great idea, even if it's of a spiritual sense, like when you brought up churches, like within the, the spiritual community. And yet this roadmap, there's a time to, to lean in and there, then there's a, a time to let go. So stage six, yeah. Scott. Absolutely. So to, to just finish up your point here on stage five, it creates this question that, that catches most founders by surprise. They find themselves in this like, am I being put out to pasture? Like what's going on? They find themselves asking the question, who am I? And it's an uncomfortable question to ask. When you, you have a successful multi-million, even multi-billion dollar uh, organization, uh, when, or you've started multiple companies, everyone's looking at you as successful. Everyone thinks you have it all figured out. And you find yourself sitting in your office one day wondering, who, uh, if, if you aren't all that success, who are you? And if you don't stop and take some time to figure that out, if you don't find a guide or a coach or someone who can walk you through the process of figuring that out, if you don't find something bigger than you, In it's virtually world. impossible. Yeah, it's virtually impossible to step into stages six and seven with any degree of success. Because to step into stage six successfully, you have to be confident in who you are because only from the confidence of who you are can you really step into what's next for you in a way that is advantageous not only to you but to those who succeed you in the organization it's where you set the stage not just for your own personal payday but to build the lasting legacy that you've really worked all these years and decades for and stage six is what i call the true owner it's where we can actually, for the very first time, own our business and not run it. Yes. One of the things that you had shared is uh, legacy. You know, what is it that we're going to leave behind? But you've also raised the point that founders are driven by legacy. You know, this idea of something bigger than them. Um, so say more about stage six. Yeah. Stage six is uh, is, is pretty straightforward. And, and what's What's magical about stage six is if you get to stage six in the right time and doing the right things. One of the temptations is to try and skip here earlier on, right? When we're back in the disillusioned leader stage or something like that. And what happens is we end up with this kind of love-hate relationship with stage six because we never really hand off the business to somebody else. And so what happens if you don't go through the stages leading up to this point is you never build the own internal capacity of yourself and the organizational capacity to run without you. 
And, and in doing that, if you can create that capacity, that's what gives you the freedom that you've wanted f f since you started the business. When you look at study after study, the number one, two th or three reason that founders start their business is either for freedom or, or autonomy. And stage six is where you really taste that in fullness. Yes, yes. So what would you like to share before I ask you a couple of personal questions to close out? What would you like to say about stage seven? Because this is where yes. I think they, they've got to not just be that manager of, uh, of finding the great operations person, the, you know, the right people for the right team, the right talent. But now they've got to find a visionary like themselves who can see a vision beyond what they've built. So it's not that I would be carrying on Scott's vision. It's, you know, what, what is it that can be built? Like going back to the yes. about Steve Jobs, what can, what can the next executives then build upon what Steve Jobs started? Yeah. So um, here's what's cool about stage seven. And that is that when, when folks reach stage seven, they find out that there's actually something better than freedom and autonomy. As wonderful as those things are, there is this, this beautiful purpose that comes from giving back, right? From pouring into others. From, uh, there's this Greek proverb that, that says, uh, society grows great when old men plant trees under whose shade they'll never sit. When we can do things that we will never personally benefit from, you, you, I would I would challenge you to find a more rewarding stage and or activity than that. And that's what's on offer for us uh, if we graduate to stage seven, the visionary founder. Well, I think at that point, you're right. I think it becomes bigger than the founder themselves. I think it becomes, you know, truly service to others, service to the next generations beyond just yeah. uh, the founder as that star player that can make that sports touchdown in the, the field where the clock is ticking and the, the pressure's there. So to round out our conversation today, what does the word legacy mean to you personally? And what would you like your legacy to be? Yeah. So for me personally, I, I, I've always wanted to build something that outlasts me, right? I, I have always wanted to, and, and I think that Greek proverb really, really holds it all together. For me, legacy is laying a foundation that others can build on beyond me. If, if if those who succeed me, if those who follow in my footsteps, if those who come behind me, you know, my children, people who read what my work, whatever it may be, if they are if they are stuck under my ceiling, I've not moved us forward. But if my ceiling can become their floor, that's the legacy I want to leave behind. That's lovely. What would you say are your top three or four core values? Uh, for me, um, core values are uh, I love challenge, right? I, I, I want to be challenged. I want to challenge others. Uh, I love change. Uh, and, and I also uh, think that character is, is necessary through all of that. So challenge, change, and character are three massive values for me that I hope come through in everything I do. That's wonderful. And I know you shared in our preamble, you were born on the West Coast. You grew up in Pittsburgh. You're now in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. Who inspired you growing up? Wow, Grona. I had a lot of really wonderful father figures, including my own dad, uh, when I was growing up. Businessmen and leaders uh, in both the business in the business world. Some church uh, 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 guys that that really took me under their wing and treated me like a son. And so I had a, an abundance of really wonderful father figures in my life uh, that that I owe a lot to. Oh, that's lovely. And final question: If you were to set aside a weekend or two for the next year to design a hardcover coffee table book for your le legacy, what would be in it? Wow, what would be in it? Uh, I would hope uh, pictures of my wonderful kids. Uh, and and so I I, I have uh, I was told once very wise advice, and and the what we leave behind is how we make people feel and the words that we write down. And so I would hope that it would be the words that I've written down and the words th and, and to be able to hear how that made others feel. Oh, that's beautiful. That's lovely. Any closing thoughts before I read out my final paragraph? Yeah, I think with all of this, there's a temptation to, uh, you know, when you know there's a next level, there's this temptation, especially for goal-oriented, achievement-oriented founders to to put their happiness on hold until they reach that next level, whatever it may be. And and I want folks to know there is that happiness does not exist in a destination, right? 
no matter how cool Disney World is. Uh, happiness doesn't exist in a destination. Happiness is only ever found in the journey. Yeah, and I want to highlight one thing uh, you had at the end of every stage. You had a section of what it, it is to enjoy that stage because people are so yes. ready to run to the next thing, that carrot on the stick. And I think you're encouraging them to to stop, look around and enjoy that moment and, and to, to cherish everything that there is in that stage and not think that you just have to accumulate in the societal status quo idea of, you know, just running so far out there and forgetting the here and the now. Okay. That's and, absolutely um, right. What is the best website if a listener would like to find your book? Yeah, they can head on over to scalearchitects.com forward slash founders. Uh, if you go to scalearchitects.com, there's a button on there as well. So scalearchitects.com forward slash founders. You can get a free copy of the full book and check out the end of every chapter because there's a joy that's available to you today that if you miss it now, you'll regret it later. Beautiful. In closing, I'm Angelina Carlton, the hostess of the Design Your Legacy podcast, as well as the founder of Legacy Planning a boutique advisory firm based out of Beverly Hills, California, USA, but international in those I consult. I hope to dive deep into subjects that can help a person define, develop, and execute their legacy and continue to scour the landscape for those who can be great resources to every dimension of your legacy. For many listeners, there can never be enough education and preparation in the moot or moat around your castle. Whether you find yourself with generational wealth or new wealth, May the content on this channel be an anchor in any storms ahead. We do our best to provide original content for your intellectual and emotional curiosity. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're tuning in on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, etc., please remember to rate, review, share your thoughts, send an email to Scott or myself. Share this episode with your friends and family. So thank you so much for joining us right now this week. And thank you, Scott, for speaking into your legacy. Thanks, Angelina. I appreciate it.